NBC's Garrett Hake is in Washington. Joyce Vance is a former U.S. attorney, law professor at the University of Alabama, and an MSNBC legal analyst. And MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin joins me now on set. Okay, say the least, Lisa. Anybody who read this? The judge didn't mince words. He didn't just reject Trump's legal team's argument. I think he pretty much made mincemeat of it. He said it's basically obvious to anyone who listens to Trump's remarks that they pose a threat. So I wonder what you make of not just the judge's order, but the way he framed it. Well, first of all, to your point, he is not mincing words. I've never seen or I've rarely seen a judge do so much in so few pages. This is only a five-page order, but the words chosen are careful and precise. And when I read it, I went, whoa, last night. But the other thing that I think is important to see here is that Judge Mershon is drawing a connection between the attacks on his daughter and, for example, attacks on D.A. Bragg's family and what that signals to anybody else who could find themselves a participant in that proceeding. And that's why he says that future violations will be met with sanctions, including criminal contempt, which can mean up to 30 days imprisonment, because he says it doesn't just affect the people that you're terrorizing, it affects anybody else that could be a participant here. I want to read to you a quote from the order that really made an impact on me. He says, all citizens called upon to participate in these proceedings, whether as a juror, a witness, or in some other capacity, must now concern themselves, not only with their own personal safety, but with the safety and the potential for personal attacks upon their loved ones. That reality cannot be overstated. And so, again, what he's saying is the threat environment here, even if directed right now at his own daughter, it affects anybody who could touch this case. It affects me. It affects potential jurors. It affects people throughout our news organization and other news organizations all throughout the country. It impacts all of us and therefore should be taken seriously. Joyce, you wrote about this. You called it the most serious development we've seen yet from a judge in terms of taking steps toward punishing Trump for threatening behavior. And Lisa just laid out why he felt so strongly. But can you explain this to people? Because maybe from the outside, it can be tough to see how Trump is being impacted at all, let alone punished. Yes, yeah, so if, if Trump was a toddler, and I think we've all often suggested he behaves like one, this would be the sort of progressive discipline you would use to try to contain a toddler's misbehavior. At the outset of the case, the judge declined to impose any gag order at all. He admonished Trump to behave. When that didn't work, the judge imposed the initial gag order in this case, which was billed as a very limited gag order. And now, as Trump has proven it necessary, the judge hasn't just expanded the gag order, but as Lisa mentioned, the judge was very specific in telling Trump what the consequences for violating it were and talking about New York con criminal contempt, which would permit the judge, if he made a finding, that Trump, for instance, um, made social media posts about potential witnesses with an intent to influence the proceedings. The judge could impose fines or could even impose custodial time. I know this is frustrating for viewers who think that Trump is getting better treatment than any other defendant, but this slow measured series of progressive steps is important to showing both the fairness of the process and ensuring that Trump has no legitimate appeal argument when this happens, if it does happen. Happen. Many folks believe Trump won't be able to heed even this very serious warning. So, Garrett, when Trump goes after people, as he has in this case, you could argue it's a twofer, right? On one hand, you have exactly what Lisa said, which is, if you're somebody who's called to jury duty, do you worry about whether you should serve on a jury? Because might he go after you or your family? Then you have Trump's former attorney, Ty Cobb, who told Politico that this is strategic in another way, that the goal is to delegitimize the proceedings. And I wonder if you've heard anything from anyone involved in the campaign expressing concern that he's going too far. Uh, maybe there's the possibility that Trump's words actually do spur someone to act beyond, you know, trying to cause havoc in the lives of a judge or his family. 
Well, Chris, the short answer to your question is no. I mean, it's not the kind of thing that members of the campaign typically deal with, although the evidence for that kind of thing is all around them. Going back to 2018, when a lot of us remember covering those pipe bombs that were sent to political figures around the country by someone who essentially was inspired by going after Donald Trump's enemies, to all the people who've testified in court related to January 6th related cases about the way in which they felt the former president's influence on their behavior. But I think the Ty Cobb comment is spot on in the sense that Donald Trump's attacks on a judge or on a judge's family member are, in, in some cases, one of the oldest tricks in his book. It goes back, you know, years and years before he was even a political figure as a way to make all of the uh, cases against him, whatever they may be, be about him and about politics and not about their own legal merits. And so, you know, to the degree that there's a campaign-related strategy here, I think that's it. The kind of Trumpian core principle of when someone is attacking you, whomever you think that someone might be, you attack them twice as hard, and that if you kind of lash out at everything and make everything political, it makes it hard for disinterested people to kind of see through the smoke and figure out what's what. Those are the strategic imperatives to the degree there are any here in play for Donald Trump and his campaign. But I wouldn't anticipate anybody who works for him telling him perhaps enough is enough or it's time to rein this in. That's just not the way the Trump campaign in this iteration works. Nor is there any indication that he would listen, right? So, Joyce, Correct. we know judges have faced persistent threats to their safety. They've been swatted, for example. We know the son of Judge Esther Salas was killed in New Jersey by a man who was coming after her. Uh, she actually spoke with my colleague, Nicole Wallace, yesterday. And take a listen to it. Yesterday was Easter. Mm -hmm. I had to celebrate it without my son, yeah. you know? And, and so I say, you know, I, I can't imagine what goes through any parent's head when you think that something you did, the job that you chose, right. cost the life of my only child. And that's a reality I have to live with. And, um, and I'm, you know, I, I, I do my best to remember that Daniel was so proud of his mom. And I do my best, my best to remember that I am doing my son justice by continuing to advocate for better security. So, Joyce, when you hear that Donald Trump sees this as a political strategy and then you hear a Judge Salas who has to live with the reality that her son died because of the job she has, not her fault, but she has talked about that connection. What goes through your mind? Yeah, so, you know, I think Judge Salas and other judges, Judge Reggie Walton in the District of Columbia, who've spoken out, we need to hear their voices because no one who chooses to serve the public as a judge should pay for it with the life of their child or threats to their family members. You know, to some extent, judges and prosecutors assume that risk when they take on um, the honor, but also the responsibilities of public service. But Trump, by refusing to back down from the violence, which, Chris, he could do so easily, he could speak to his followers and say, look, I am critical of these judges, but you must never attack the judges or their families or anyone associated with the case. I'm not calling for violence. I'm condemning violence. That would be such an easy thing for Trump to do. And the fact that he won't and that he hasn't tells us that he, in some sense, thinks that it's OK and that what, for instance, a Judge Salas has gone through is a desirable res result. That is just an utterly despicable sort of a view, a callous view from a former president, a would-be future president. A and what I think is appalling here is that political figures have failed to stand up and counter Trump. That means that individual judges are now in the position of having to speak in public, something that they do very infrequently to condemn this behavior. At least, at least to talk about the position this puts Judge Juan Marchand in, because he wrote about how this does absolutely threaten the integrity of judicial proceedings. He made clear mm -hmm. why he feels this is important. Um, on the other hand, he's a human being. Yep. And he has to go into a courtroom and he has to be a judge. Mm -hmm. He has to be impartial. Some people, particularly on perhaps the Trump-leaning side might suggest he can't possibly be, and in fact already is not impartial. Mm -hmm. It's difficult for any judge, I would imagine, to impose a penalty on a defendant for something he said, mm -hmm. especially if he's a former president and current candidate for president of the United States. Where does that leave Juan Marchand? 
I think it leaves Wilmer Sean in a very difficult situation because essentially right now, he has to not only be a judge for what's going on in his courtroom, but there are expectations of him nationwide, right? It's a, what I said to Nicole yesterday was this is like a massive collective action problem where you have a problem that everyone can see and it is happening from coast to coast or at least state to state. We've seen this happen in Georgia and we've seen it happen in New York and we've seen it happen in D.C. And, and by the way, much of the rest of the world is watching as well. Correct. And yet he is the one person right now who is in a position to do something about it. What's really tricky here is to the extent that he does do something about it, he then lends credence to the motion that Trump wants to make now and said yesterday he's going to try to make to recuse Judge Mershon from the case, thereby postponing and indefinitely delaying this trial. I don't think Judge Mershon will grant that motion. I also have confidence that if Trump violates this order in a clear and willful way, there will be consequences, but it doesn't make it any easier to know that people are going to accuse you of bias simply for trying to uphold the rule of law and walk into your courtroom every day and do justice. Those are the comments that he made to the Associated Press, essentially, that he's going to try to do this job with integrity. And even that was a bridge too far for the Trump people who said on the basis of his comments to the AP, that in and of itself is warrants a recusal here. He can't win. Lisa Rubin, Garrett Haig, Joyce Van, such an important conversation. Thank you all. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.